Kavi, I am so excited to be here with you. Um, we we're just saying before this went live, this is our, our second interview, but it's such an important topic. So um, thanks for, for having me in such a, an interesting and important initiative. Thank you, Lori. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is such a testament to how we all come together with everything that you're doing, everything that XRSI is doing. And now as we step into these unknown territories, these uncharted territories, it's fantastic that I am, I'm honored to commence this journey with you. Well, you know, it's interesting because we first met, I was doing a piece for 60 Minutes. So for folks listening, um, and I'm sorry that we're not, I, I'm not in the, the metaverse with folks, right? I, I had trouble like being able to move my hands and look around. So this is my fault that we're being streamed in. Um, but I will say when we first met, I was doing a piece for 60 Minutes and we were thinking, we were doing a whole thing on the metaverse. This was back in March. And I remember I was like trying to convince them that like we should do this thing on this thing called the metaverse, right? Which was hard enough to explain like to executives even at 60 Minutes that the metaverse was gonna be a thing. Um, and we're thinking, God, we've really, you know, we've got to talk about the issues that are going to come, not just like how cool this is. And that's how we found you. And I'll never forget sitting in front of you and you saying, you know, there are so many issues that are going to come that we have to talk about. Um, and, and so it was really cool to meet you then and to see how much has shifted, even from, you know, when that piece came out, we filmed it in March or April and it came out in June till now. Um, so maybe a good way to start is just tell me a little bit about your background. I can get into mine clearly 60 minutes, but tell me a little bit about your background and what you guys are, are trying to do with, with this whole initiative and what you're building. I know. And as, thank you, Lori. And uh, remember, we, we started with like, what is the metaverse? I remember you asking about that. And then it's like, is it real? And here we are, you know, post meta announcement, post some of the other companies announcement, uh, metaverse is real. And this is why we are here. And yeah. uh, about myself though, you know, our quest to understand these complex technologies, th for me personally, it started in, you know, 2011 when I read this book called Cyber War and I realized these, uh, you know, decisions will be made about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. that not a lot of generals that do offensive stuff on cyber domain might understand. So I got busy teaching myself, you know, what is cybersecurity, uh, did my master's in network security, and then fast forward, moved to California in 2016, found myself doing, uh, you know, US presidential election time that was, and I found myself doing third party security. And we know that <laughs> the biggest scandal uh, in the digital history came, you know, through that time, through that uh, sort of a duration, and I had the front row to it. Uh, and then right after that, when I assumed the role of head of security for Linden Lab, which is some people may know, it's, uh, you know, the maker of Second Life, the oldest existing virtual world. So mm -hmm. being this head of security there, uh, it really opened my eyes. And then the background of how technology can impact society in such grave manners can uh, undermine democracies can cause things like Brexit, uh, can bring down dictators. And now we are seeing, you know, the impact of technology can lead to people not getting vaccinated and that just perpetuating the pandemic and whatnot. Uh, so these kind of like much larger unintended consequences now we anticipate are going to happen in these metaversical domain, you can say, you know, convergence of all kinds of technologies. But, you know, if we talk about the metaverse, this is like the interface of it, the XR is kind of like the interface for all these technologies. So my journey, you know, this has just been, I was grateful the time I got my badge of honor getting terminated from uh, Linden Lab. And then I started this, you know, uh, just like Timnit Gebru and many others ethicists, who yeah. do have to face these challenges when they try to raise their voices around ethics and privacy and safety. They do face these challenges. And thankfully, I found uh, really amazing, uh, brilliant people to come together. And now we've formed this amazing initiative. Uh, and today we take this, you know, this is the second annual XR Safety Week. And today I'm just honored to continue this 
awareness campaign and we anticipate this campaign would become a global campaign which it already is we have so many countries participating now uh, but this would take an official form hopefully by next year and then we'll continue our journey forward you know um i think a lot i recently interviewed francis haugen who's the facebook whistleblower um, and i was thinking to myself i wonder a decade from now will there be the metaverse whistleblower, right? If we're not careful. Um, and, you know, my background has always been, I created our startup beat at CNN back in 2009. So I, when people weren't paying attention, I was knocking on corner offices and saying, hey, we got to put this guy, Jack Dorsey on camera. Like we got to put the founders of Instagram or Uber or Airbnb on camera. There were these, these tiny little companies that promised to change the world. And I remember you know, so many of those folks um, sitting across from them, the minnows before they were sharks to some degree, promising to this idea that, um, you know, the app store had come out. There was this moment in time, we were coming out of the recession and it was this beautiful moment, right? Of like creativity and, and everybody was going in and like you could code your idea into the hands of millions of people. Um, and that was really fascinating to me. And you and you didn't have to play by the rules because the rules felt old and industries were being disrupted. And, and mm -hmm. I remember just jumping on board and, and creating this beat at, that didn't exist, right? At my own network. Yeah. Um, and, and I think for me, and I, I get the sense for you, given that you had a front row seat, for me, it's personal too, right? Because um, I, I watched as these companies got huge, as these people who promised to change the world for the better, I watched as they got complicated. I sat across from Mark Zuckerberg during Cambridge Analytica and asked what went wrong? You know, why weren't we thinking about these things? I asked these questions along the way. And so for me, what I sense and why I'm excited to be here with you and having these conversations, and I hope that these conversations just amplify and amplify and amplify, right, um, is because we're coming out, well, I'm not sure we're coming out of the pandemic. We are, there was a pandemic that accelerated innovation in the same way the recession accelerated innovation um, over a decade ago. And now we're entering a new era of the internet that's even more immersive where our mm -hmm. children are spending more time in these spaces. Um, and it seems more than ever that now I'm hearing these same things from founders and from people saying, hey, we're gonna create this better world. You know, this one's more immersive. We're gonna create, a more decentralized world. We're going to help, you know, people take ownership back. We're going to be living in these metaverse experiences, and it's going to be so much better than this last decade. And I love hearing that. I'm not just, I'm not a pessimist, but a part of me, and I'm sure you understand this part of me, just thinks to myself, here we go again, right? Because if we're not careful, not only will we repeat the same mistakes as you know the, the last decade, but the stakes will be even higher this go around and the next iteration of the web because it's so much more in our face. So I guess that's a huge, that's first of all why it's personal to me, but I, I guess that's a setup for me to, to say to you, what's at stake now that we are talking about the metaverse and NFTs and crypto and all these different worlds that people are just wrapping their heads around that it seems it's just access based insiders right now that are that are really understanding it. What do you think is at stake? A lot. And uh, this is, uh, you know, not to be an alarmist, but you know, I'm more of a realist about these things, uh, especially, you know, in back in 2018, 19, as I was protecting two virtual economies and, you know, Linden Lab or Second Life had the very first virtual currency. And imagine uh, trying to wrap your head around about 52 state laws. And then around 2018, we had GDPR come about. So they like, and then New York Department of Financial Services rolled out their own laws. So right now what's happening is with that experience, what it tells me, this complexity of virtual currency is just one aspect of it. Then there is other technologies like, you know, augmented reality with, uh, you know, what Niantic is putting out and my Microsoft is sort of jumping into all these things. So these technologies, they require data collection. So what I call it, we are arriving at the era of constant reality capture. So, you know, during the, I mean, in the internet era, we fought die hard for, uh, you know, anonymity. 
and privacy. In the metaverse era, this is even more complex, but we're gonna fight for our agency. You know, when somebody knows your thoughts, thought patterns at least, and potentially even your thoughts, and they are able to measure your EKG data, EMG data through these, you know, wrist devices, or these other brain computer interfaces that, you know, maybe non-invasive, but they can combine with your goggles. Like these convergences can now cause a person to not be making decision by themselves. And we're seeing that, you know, in the internet era, we are sort of distant from here is my computer or this is my phone and here I am. Imagine, when these companies will have agency or they will cover what you see, you know, and they will determine how, I mean, right now, if Google says take right, you take right, right? And then, so if you're taking instructions through the glasses, if this is your UI UX, or this is your interface and the data that, you know, is captured or the artificial intelligence algorithm that determines where you should go right or left, if there is a cyber attack, for example, if the company itself, you know, I, I love that people are committing that we won't make the same mistakes, but just like 2016, it's not that we intended to make those mistakes. It's just that these technologies are so complex. And as a cybersecurity professional, every time you have these incredible amount of data collection, especially about people's thoughts, Potentially, we call it biometrically inferred data, where you can even make inferences about people's, you know, disease or pregnancy and potentially determine what could be potentially happening. So predictive analysis based on that data could lead to losing the agency, losing uh, an autonomy. So it's not just now anonymity because, you know, constant reality capture where you go be anonymous if you have to reveal your location, you have to give away your data to purchase some crypto or other things, then um, we need to understand how do we make sure that this data doesn't end up in the hands of adversaries and they don't use it in a malicious ways. So there's so many complex issues with this convergence that we need to understand. Another big one could be about children. You know, yeah. children are going to step into these things like Roblox is a prime example or Neantix, you know, release this Pikmin Bloom. And it could be very addictive to want to feel better because these technologies can potentially make you feel better, give you that little head of dopamine. And then you're just going around planting flowers. And then suddenly you realize that the moment you feel kind of anxious that you want to go plant those flowers. And that is a path to addiction because it's, you know, small head of dopamine, small head of good things. Yeah. And then soon before, you know, we want it more and more. So addiction, right. body dysmorphia, maybe I don't want to live in the real life. I love my virtual reality because, I mean, even if you look around me right now, there is like a lot of, a uh, little bit of, you know, scientist kind of a personality. I've got too many papers around here. So real life is real life. It comes with its own challenges. Yeah. And this extended reality, what we call it, like virtual augmented mixed reality, that gives us an alternate. That could give us like a fascinating, beautiful view that I may not have sitting here. And, right. I, you know, human, human nature, we want it. And so those are just tremendous amount of issues that we need to kind of get in front of. And even if we do, things will break. And so we need to be ready for it. You know, I remember you saying to me, like, you're worried that our children who are spending more and more time, I think, by the way, I think a lot of people think about the metaverse as ready player one, right? As this idea that we put on this headset and we're just in this whole other reality. Well, I think the reality is, and you can, you know, correct me if you think it's something different, but is that we're all beginning to already live in some version of the metaverse, right? Like That's you talk right. about children spending time in Roblox and in these video games, you talk about, and it's not that just they're playing games, they're building communities. They're putting more weight on their virtual shoes or in the NFT of their virtual shoes than they would on shoes in the real world. They're building communities and friendships. And with that become, comes an extraordinary amount of, of responsibility. I mean, I remember what you said to me during our 60 Minutes interview, which was that you worry that 
our children won't be able to decipher what's real and what's not, you know, that these dolphins in these worlds aren't, aren't going to be flying in the real world. And I thought that was such an extraordinary thing to say and something we're just not anticipating. And, and I'll, I'll say, you know, I was, um, I've, I've, one of the things I've been thinking about that I don't think, God, it's, it's just, we don't even see these things coming until they're too far behind us. Um, and that's been my experience at that intersection of technology and humanity and covering a lot of these things and being a part of these roller coasters of innovation. You know, I was talking to recently um, a, a board member of Sandbox um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Sandbox is a, is a metaverse, it's a game, it's growing tremendously. Um, and, you know, he was talking about how God, people are buying up virtual land, same with Upland, another one, and people are buying up virtual land this idea that people are going to live more in these spaces. And, and what he said was in the last year, something over a hundred million dollars has been spent on virtual land and sandbox. And I remember I just said to him, I remember we were on stage and I said, well, how many, what's your demographic of users? And he said, well, it's like mostly men, you know? And then I said, well, so let me just to, not to, to, let's just reframe it a bit. You know, these virtual worlds that are the future are being built and and bought by men. And so it's, if you think back to the wild west, right? Like it feels like we're going into some old school way of like these worlds are being built by and for men. And, and so I thought that was, you know just something we're not even thinking about. Um, and I think he had a light bulb moment. He was like, well, we're gonna definitely try to include more women but how do we do that or more diversity? And so I think these are all things um, you know, that are, that are super important. Um, and, I, and I think you know, something I'm curious for you to maybe touch on is a digital divide, right? Um, you know, maybe we're not right near Ready Player One, um, but but what role do you think this next iteration of the internet, this what we call Web three, will play when it comes to the future that we could see ha more haves and have nots than we did in the past? Yeah, and that's a very significant question for all of humanity, you know, as pretty like, you know, this is exactly how it happens. We we were dealing with these larger computers with big sizes, and then suddenly this is what the computer looks like these days. And then now pretty soon, which the world may, may or may not be ready for it, but we will be interfacing through these devices. In fact, just about you know, just just to agree with you, yesterday or day before I read the article, the Decentraland, a particular land, sold over two million dollars. Just a virtual land. It's pixels, if you really think about it. But that's incredible. And so the people, there, there is a whole talk about, oh, well, how do we deal with the data and the ownership? And then even people talk about, let's, let's, allow people to own their data and then let's pay them for their data and then that is going to cause even further digital divide because if I'm a poor person and you give me some amount of money to potentially be like hey participate in this thing and then we'll pay you this money then of course as, uh, as somebody who needs the money I'm just going to give you give all the autonomy all the privacy and all that stuff back so these are very complicated but really, really significant issues that must be taught proactively, especially like diversity and inclusion. This is why XR Safety Week, I mean, we've chosen these matters and focus areas to really address this. In fact, I wanna bring it back to you, uh, Laurie, about the role of media in all this, because I think that's something where we can really start to highlight and how do we do this? And then now this new internet is building and I you know, saw this amazing remarkable video that you made and you know, as a founder of dot, dot, dot media, now the, you are also leading this awareness fight. Like, I wanna bring it back to you, like in terms of like awareness or media, I think my, my hunch is that media has a huge role to play maybe yeah. in the translation or something. So how are we gonna do this? Because this is a shared responsibility. So some part, you know, I'm a nerd who likes to solve large problems, but we need your help. And I think all of us are gonna have to come together, right? Yeah, um, I feel so strongly about it, right? I, I think about it, I was at CNN for a decade and then I left to go create dot, dot, dot. And um, we were operating a bit as a production company and arms dealer doing really great stuff around tech and, and humanity, podcasts and shows and that kind of stuff. And I was part-time with 60. But um, for me, 
all of a sudden, I think it started even with our interview, right? Uh, back in, in March or April, I, I got that spidey sense, the same thing that went off in me um, back in 2009 when people weren't really paying attention to these corners that this is gonna be the biggest thing to happen um, since web one, web two. And if we don't do a better job covering it, um, we're, and, and with accountability and with asking these complicated questions as we build it, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And, and, I, and I personally, for me, um, even media has changed, right? For me, these complicated questions, we have a, a responsibility to uh, educate the mainstream, but these complicated questions, I didn't just want to do from afar, right? I didn't want to just do a, for a couple minutes on morning television, which I'm happy to do, right? Like I, that's also a part of my responsibility. I wanted to build a platform, a media platform devoted to this because I think this is the, the biggest thing to happen. And, and I want to be able to devote every second of my day to, to helping, you know, raise awareness of voices, important voices like yours, um, you know, not just being part of the hype machine, but, you know, helping onboard people into these new worlds. I think, you know, we're talking about this thing that feels so inside baseball, but, you know, it's going to impact the way you raise your children. It is going to impact democracy. It's going to impact like politics and shopping and small businesses. And right now it just feels like crypto bros, but it's not. And so, you know, I've always viewed myself as a translator for Silicon Valley because I have a seat at the table. So what's the best way to use that seat? For me, it's building my own media platform, right? So that's what we're doing um, with an initiative we have called D3, which is part of dot, dot, dot. And we're really exploring not only just, you know, how do we create videos and content and all sorts of stuff devoted to helping people understand and getting the on, you know, onboarding the mainstream into these worlds, but also what's a bit of an experiment, to be quite honest with you, in journalism of how do we build a Web3 media company? So what does that mean? It still sounds like super inside baseball, but like, how do we take the best of what Web3 has to offer, which is um, transparency and, you know, being more open and decentralization and apply some of those concepts to media. And so we're exploring how do we do, you know, uh, a DAO that would enable a uh, editorial board where you see what decisions we're making, oh. right? Um, like that could go one way or the other. And so we're having these really interesting conversations about, well, what would that look like? And, and how do we give, if people want to be a part of our platform, how do we give them ownership over it? Is that through tokens and tokenization? Is that through an NFT where they get exclusive access? And so that's where stuff gets really exciting to me of creating part digital media company, but part web three media company and give power back to creators. As a, a production company for the last year, we've also seen that creators kind of get screwed in many ways. Like, yeah. you know, sorry to put it so bluntly, but you have a great idea for a show, you give it to, you put it out there, you end up getting very little back. And so if there is, you know, aspects of web three that enable more power for creators to own more of their content. That's great. So how do we take the best and the worst? But you won't see me blindly go in and just say, and we're doing this and it's going to be amazing. I think it's more of an experiment and we have to see what works and what we, it doesn't. And we have to be cautious and smart. So that's what we're doing. And I'm, I'm so excited to do it. And I also want to raise awareness of the right voices and ask the right questions and challenge the right people. Um, because that's, you know, it's in my DNA, right? But I want to do it for me um, as my own media company, because isn't that such a Web3 thing, <laughs> you know? So that's correct. That's that is so correct. Doing. So I, I appreciate, um, you know, I appreciate you asking. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm curious for you guys. I mean, so that's kind of what we're doing. What are you guys doing behind the scenes? Like, so what are the the tangible next steps for you. I think it's so interesting. Like we talk about these things and they seem so far away. Are people listening? Like is Facebook paying attention? Sorry, Meta is Meta paying attention? <laughs> um, are lawmakers paying attention? Like who's listening? Who's not? Like what do we, what work do we have? So I think, you know, so recently I took this two months trip to Europe to try to inform and I literally just tasked myself to do so. And as soon as I got back, that I went to Augmented World Expo in Santa Clara, as soon as that finished, we got busy uh, preparing for another conference that I just got back from its conference where I was informing all five branches, six branches, Space Force, uh, of the military and delivering the XRSI has this privacy and safety framework. So uh, 
exercise role has thus far been first is creating the baseline understanding. So back when we first started, people were fighting on Twitter. What the hell is VR? What is AR? And we're like, it is XR because so many experts have spoken. People from Unity spoke and many other people spoke. Mm -hmm. So we kind of curate knowledge to create baseline of standards where there exists none. And these are uncharted territories. So how do you standardize uncharted territories? We have to continuously do incremental improvement. And you mentioned DAO. So decentralized autonomous organizations. This seems to me a fantastic idea if executed properly. So you can have sort of like a bottom up approach of leadership approach of decision making. So while I can't quite disclose all of it, but we are going towards an, you know, an approach where we'll use these type of protocols to build you know, decision makings around our frameworks potentially, or you know, further these things. In terms of who's listening, well, I was saying during my entire trip at Europe, like thanks to the dude bro sitting in the valley doing all kinds of things, and especially, you know, um, when I was in Italy, these uh, Facebook or meta reality glasses were launched and suddenly, you know, there's so many inquiries and journalists and regulators came about, it's like, what's going on? And then the whole meta announcement spooked a lot of people. So thus far, I mean, e-safety commissioner of Australia, I commend Julie uh, Grant Inman. She is an amazing woman who is also just like us. And it's, it's quite remarkable that women actually are really being proactive about these things. We have this maybe natural instinct about, you know, protecting or something. So Julie Inman is one of those leading voices in the regulation side, uh, e-safety commissioner of Australia. Uh, you know, she's the e-safety commissioner of Australia and she's one of those, you know, first people who came on board and in fact we'll hear from her on day three uh, which is the diversity and inclusion day uh, then we have so many senators like and house of representative from the united states like kathy castor they're trying to do copa reform senator ed marquis actually came about to consult on this law called camera act which is for children uh, about you know how their well-being would be impacted and that would be probably the first law in the united states that we'll have because of our consultation augmented reality, virtual reality mentioned in it. We have uh, National Health Services. British Health Services is actually taking part in this XR Safety Week as well and sponsoring the medical XR aspect. Because when we talk about these, you know, sort of mental agency, medical is the thing that we're going to lean on because patient safety is going to help us try to grapple these complex data issues. Because in some cases, we do want to share the data. So, you know, again, trying to bring everybody to, you know, to table to try to understand in some context, it's okay to share data in some context, it's okay to go towards these technologies, but the same context could put people at risk. For example, you know, I remember when I first joined uh, Facebook back in the days, I had to create a Facebook account. And I had converted to Islam during that time and no one knew that I was Muslim and stuff. And then suddenly Facebook's AI just started to connect me with all these, you know, my Hindu relatives and they were like sending death threats. So that's a very personal example of yeah. imagine if you are a transgender person who doesn't want to tell the world that this is, you know, it just, you want to maintain your agency, your freedom. And if these technologies disclose, profile you, or you know, even could put you at risk of never even getting an interview because somebody knows that you are going uh, to be pregnant. And I know in Japan, these kinds of issues exist. Wow. So globally, the data could really put us at risk. I mean, fairly recently, Accenture bought about 60,000 Quest 2 headsets to do training. My question is, uh, who is going to make sure that that data is not used by the HR manager or by, you know, Facebook or somebody, Meta, uh, to, you know, analyze people's behavior to really, you know, determine, oh, you're not getting a promotion because you get tired so soon, because we can, you know, in the next versions of these things, we could analyze cognitive loads. Some of the HMDs, wow. you can already do that. Like Boeing, for example, uses these kinds of things. And a lot of these 
military operations and stuff in some of the confidential operations, they're already analyzing how to increase soldier lethality. Imagine right. this data ending up in the hands of adversaries. So globally, societally, we have a lot to worry about where I keep saying data, data, you know, it's like it's metaverse, but really just the metadata behind it, because thus far we've only talked about, oh, let's make laws about personal identifiable information and those things exist, but not, not this kind of data, not the biometrically inferences or inferred data. So let's see, you know, the good news is we're here and we're starting this awareness campaign, so especially right before the holidays, because, you know, we have the money, we're going to go buy these gadgets and some people will engage in this thing. So hopefully people will benefit from right. these conversations. That's what do you us. what do you say to folks who say, OK, the metaverse and all this stuff, it's a buzzword. It's so far out. We're not living in Ready Player One, even VR and these headsets like everyone's been saying VR is going to be a big thing for like decades and it just hasn't, hit, you know, hasn't hit. Why now and why do we need to pay attention now? It's so important that people understand that even if you didn't touch these glasses, somebody else could be monitoring you without letting you know because this tiny little light sometimes people are putting on augmented reality isn't going to be enough to mitigate the risk of like constant reality capture. So rules need to be set. And there is some, it, there's a term called bystander, and then there is the bystander privacy and agency. So the term that we have used thus far for consumers who use technology is user. And XRSI deliberately, and we try to inform people and regulators and everybody that it's not the user anymore, it's individuals, it's yeah. humans. And pretty soon we'll interact with, you know, artificial intelligence agent. And we're somehow doing that. These in the NPC characters now becoming more realistic. So we need to really become human centric demand for human rights, which we will do. You know, 73rd um, Human Rights Day is on 10th of December. That's when we'll conclude this week and hopefully bring it all back to human rights, human centric. Well, and then we invite everyone to, you know, go on to uh, the website, xrsafetyweek.org or xrsi.org. And now even you are here. So, you know, dot, dot, dot media engage with you. And I think that would be a key thing to do is let's start with awareness and yeah. share this responsibility that we have for creating safety around these technologies. I think that's a great way to end it. I was going to end it with a call to action, but I think that's a great call to action. So um, thank you so much for your time. And I'm, I'm thank fascinated you. to see what you guys are going to do. And we'll keep you up to date with what we're doing. And um, I'm glad this is just the beginning of the conversation. So I'm, I'm looking forward to everything you guys are doing this week. Amazing, Laurie. And thank you for coming on board here and, you know, taking on the seat and informing people what is to come and trans becoming that official translator for the metaverse. Awesome. Thank you so much. Everyone have a have a great week. Mm -hmm.